Arthur Simmons is the man that raped us 22 years ago. It happened 20 years ago, but it's still like today. It's not just the rape, it's what he leaves behind. The anxiety, the fear. What he did that one night controls us. There's a lot that normal people do that we can't do. Restaurants, crowds, elevators. And the only way we feel like we can move on is to let him know face to face that we're letting go. I am an innocent man. And I've been here 22 years trying to prove that. I don't think I could come up with the right words to explain the mental and emotional and physical torture that I've experienced from the moment I entered prison. By me being able to meet the victims, I would hope that they would feel relaxed and say, well, we, we made a mistake. We were young. We were told to do this and told to do that by the state prosecutors because they wanted a conviction. On May 23rd, 1977, Vincent Simmons was picked up by the police in his hometown of Marksville, Louisiana, and charged with raping 14-year-old twin sisters, Karen and Sharon Sanders. Two weeks earlier, the twins, along with their 18-year-old cousin Keith, were kidnapped, forced into the trunk of the car, and driven down a remote road. The girls testified that they were taken out, one at a time, and brutally raped. Within two months, Vincent was tried, convicted, and sentenced to 100 years at hard labor. I asked God years ago to remove the anger. Anger is a disease that could destroy you. My problem is anger. I deal with a lot of anger. It's not hatred. I get mad of what he left behind. I get mad that he doesn't have a repenting heart. I've had my faith in God. I just wouldn't have had God in my life. I don't think I'd be here today sitting down with the opportunity to bring forward the truth after all these years. We made it that night, and we were supposed to die, and we didn't. And we prayed that night. And I believe it's through God that we're here. I feel kind of nervous, but I'm confident. I think that it's going to go well. This is a big step. The unknown is what's scary. I try to have a schedule. I don't think about time. I read, uh, meditate, and 
I'm constantly struggling with law. It's like a, a part of me now. And a lot of people say, you need to back off of that. You need to read other things. When you off into something and you're fighting so hard to try to prove something, you know, that you know that you're entitled to, you, you lose all sense of time. Vincent had been in prison since 1977, pursuing every legal option in every court to which he had access. And he never wavered from his original claim of innocence. Then one day, 1997 that is, I was going up for parole hearing, first time in 20 years. And the man called me one day in the dime. He said, you Vincent Simmons? I said, yeah. You should get ready. You're fixing to be on TV. That's when you and the crew appeared. It was the spring of 1997 when we headed down to Angola, Louisiana. We were making The Farm, a documentary film about life and death in America's largest prison. There are over 5,000 inmates here serving some of the longest sentences of any prison in America. Nearly 85% of those who enter the gates will die here. This is the story of six men trying to overcome the odds. Vincent Simmons was the sixth and final subject in the farm. We met him only one day before his parole board hearing. This is my first parole hearing in 20, in 20 years, and I hope to accomplish my freedom. It was also the first time we ever saw the rape victims. Karen and Sharon had come to testify against Vincent. In the past 20 years, the only comfort that we've had was to know that he could not hurt us or our family. And that's the only peace of mind that we have found. And we're just here to ask that you don't take that from us. I've lived in a lot of fear. I have a problem with black people. I'm scared of them. You're not scared of me this morning, are you? No, I wouldn't have, but I wouldn't be alone with you either. <laughs> it happened, yeah, 20 years ago. 20 years means nothing yeah. to me. That's yesterday to me. I got two grandbabies, both of them girls. One of five and one's two. And I, I was just sitting here and thinking and looking at you all. I don't know what I would do if something like that would happen to my grandbabies. This board is very sympathetic to you. You can rest assured that uh, this board is going to do its duty. I'm gonna have nothing to say to him, Simmons. I don't have nothing to say to him, but I'd like to hear what he says. I'm gonna hear what he says. I'm gonna push the basket. Mr. Simmons, come here and have a seat. All right. Good morning. Would you answer Mr. Magri's questions, please? You committed these two rapes? No, sir. What'd you say? No, sir. Tell me what happened. Well, I had newly discovered evidence because I've been trying to uh, get the evidence since I've been here to prove my innocence. You pled guilty? No, sir. Okay. And they told you, say that they want to be a, make a confession. And I told them that I wasn't going to make a confession because I was innocent. One of the officers hit me. And when I tried to jump up, the other officer jumped up and he shot me in, in, in the police station. Their version is you grabbed a pistol and you tried to kill them, and you kept pulling the trigger and it wouldn't go off, and another officer came in and shot you. I was never charged with that crime. Uh, they tried to justify shooting me. Of course, if the, if the officer wanted to kill you, he, he wouldn't have shot you. Well, he shot, me, he shot, me, shot me right, right above the heart. We didn't have none of this evidence. None of this evidence was presented before the jury because the DA had it in his file. And in these files, the doctor's report indicate that the girls were virgins. They say, why? You have those reports where the oh, doctor is... said that they were virgins? I'd like to see them. They testified before the jury that they were brutally raped. <clears throat> they repeatedly asked them, would they be able to identify this person again if they saw him? They say no, because all blacks look alike. They put you in the lineup, and they said they all picked out the man. No, when they brought me in, I was handcuffed. You were the only one handcuffed in the lineup? I'm the only one. You're the only one handcuffed. Yes, sir. 
Okay, uh, if y'all step out, we'll discuss the case. after uh, listening to testimony and going over the reports, the board has voted at this time to deny your request for parole. And certainly you have a right to, uh, to pursue your case through the United States Supreme Court, and uh, I certainly would do that. You know, that, that's yes. your legal right. <laughs> that comes on the tear, you know. Hey, man, we seen you, you're a movie star. And I just tell him, I say, I'm not, I'm not looking for to be a movie star. I'm only looking for justice. The farm was shown all over the world during the next year. And overwhelmingly, it was the parole board scene that people found most shocking. It wasn't clear that Vincent Simmons was innocent, but finding out meant going to his hometown only 50 miles from Angola prison, across the Mississippi River. that time that a black man and historically has been involved with a white woman traditionally with an all-white juror they throw the book at him as much as time as you can give him at hard labor that's that's been it You ought to watch this film called The Farm and see what you think. And Vincent's story just kind of jumped out of the film. You know, justice is an important thing. I spent 21 years in the military ready to defend with my life what I believe in, you know, what everybody before me has fought and died for, the Constitution. So I agreed to get involved and talk to as many people as I possibly could. I feel like there's something that's wrong about this, the, the case. That's why I agreed to have this interview with you. If something is not right, I just don't know exactly what it is, but the timing with the presenting court about a rape, if it did occur, it wouldn't have that time. It wouldn't have that time. It might not be in that day. When I asked him who had done it and why he had did it, he said, Mama, I didn't do it. That's all he would tell me. I'd let it go. I'd let it go. I have no idea. And anybody would tell me that Vincent did it, I still wouldn't believe it because of the way he was, you know, over here. Vincent was a good brother. You know, he used to take me to church. He used to play with us, play games with us, laugh a lot, make jokes, and tease us. He liked to work, he liked to dance, he liked to smile, he liked to do all of that, you know. That's all I know. It's just that 
I pray to God that uh, he would get out one day. My mother and, and other members of the family, sure, they, they supported me. But we come from a great family, large family. And I didn't have a father that would say, you know, give me the, the rights and the wrong and, you know, prepare me for the outside, for the world. I didn't have that. And then my mama, she was so busy working, trying to, you know, provide for us. So basically, the understanding that I had, you know, the things that I learned, I really learned it from outsiders on the streets. And, you know, I just fell off the right track and started getting arrested. So the majority of my youth was spending the juvenile home. Getting down uh, about my brother, Justin Simmons. You know, we got along, we went around. Uh, they ain't got bad down the stretch. Uh, we got in a little trouble with the law. And uh, somehow, they fell back on him. They railroaded him. That's what they did. He got 100 years for what? That's what I'm talking about. Why do you think, he, why do you think they railroaded him? Why did they Because they didn't like him. He was bigger than him. Oh, he had a nasty attitude. Ooh, he has a nasty attitude. Vincent was one of them dudes everybody knew that a, a bullet top he do, you know what But otherwise than that, he was more home to himself than he was to anybody else. How do you mean harm to himself? Oh, he did a lot of foolish things, you know. Stole some stuff, liked to get in fights. I shot him before. He was bigoted, that's what I'm telling you. He was bigoted. You know, he had a big mouth. He do things he ain't had no business. Everybody knew everybody in that town. And if anybody did something, if they thought you had a record of fighting, and if somebody would fight, they would always say, well, Benson did that. Had to know, listen to parts of everything, and then you put it all together, well, we're going to get this guy off the streets. It's time for us to get this guy off the streets. That's, that's what they done to Benson, man. Can't nobody tell me that Eddie know is a good um, district attorney when I know he ain't. We want him off the streets so bad, Say he did it. Yeah. Say he did it, and we're going to send him away. Don't he look like he, he built like the dude, right? Ain't that him? Just say he did it. Just give us the word that he did it, and you'll never see him again. One time he had broke out of jail, and I believe that's what they're holding against him. He got away with it for seven years. Where was he all that time? In Texas. Or in, um, all I know of Texas is somewhere else for all them years. And he used to come home. And they never caught him. He would come in like on a weekend and he would leave. I know I have a history of being involved in crime. I know that Eddie O and the sheriff of that parish had a dislike towards me. And when I was in Texas, I had got busted on a crime, on a, on a charge. They dismissed the charge, but they said that Louisiana have a hold on you. They gave Louisiana 60 days to come expedite me and bring me back. Louisiana never came. So the lawyer that was representing me said that, Louisiana, if you ever go back to Louisiana, he said, watch yourself, because he said, they don't forget nothing that you do. He said, if you go back to Louisiana, he said, they're going to get you. You know, and it slipped my mind. After years passed, it slipped my mind, so I come back down to Louisiana. Boom, I wasn't here, I don't think I was here a week. And I was charged with two counts back right away. Sharon Sanders, please. This is Holly Sanders. Holly, Miss Jimmy Reynolds, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm a private investigator here in Alexandria. And I'm representing a film company out of New York, producing a film 
about the crime that occurred against you and your sister and your cousin in 1977 and the prosecution of that crime. Would you be willing to tell your story and talk about the effects of, of that? I don't know that I can because of the fact that I suffer from anxiety. Mm -hmm. I suffer um, from panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be in the able to speak with the cousin who was driving the car that night? I spoke to Keith very briefly. I uh, told him who I was and who I was representing and what I was doing. And he basically said, I'm not talking to nobody about nothing. I've got to call three or four people, but right now I'm not saying nothing about nothing. And that was the end of that. I was born in the Boyle's Parish almost 74 years ago. And when you get into a small parish such as the Boyle's Parish, everybody connects to, in some way or some time, to the sheriff or the district attorney. And uh, if you were to come, and I was a public official, to talk to me and ask me some questions, by the time you leave, I would have called the sheriff to find out what it is you think I should do. This person has come, or this group has come here, and, uh, and they look like to me they want to stir up something. I know what to say. Don't talk to them. There's a lot of people in that town know the real truth. They're scared to talk. I'm telling you, the DA, as long as the DA, Eddie know, is in that seat, ain't nobody going to talk. One of the jurors even told me that uh, he would hate to be an innocent man on trial in a Royals Parish. And when I tried to talk him into telling me, telling people the stuff that he had to say, which I thought was real important, his response was, you didn't hear what I told you a while ago. I said I would hate to be an innocent man on trial in a Royals Parish. Vincent's uncle, Levi James. Levi James. He was um, he was accused of killing a teacher who had come to uh, Mansoura to teach, and later on, someone else confessed to the murder, but it was too late. He was home in 1924. Last man hung in a Royal's parish. He was considered a troublemaker. So I guess that's why they thought. He killed a woman. I heard that story all of my life. And after I was married, my in-laws talked about it. My mother talked about it. Everybody talked about the legend of Levi James. To know that you're innocent and they take your life, make you feel really bad. And knowing that he was a relative of mine. You know, it could happen to anyone, though. How you describe a racial relations here in town. Small town, people get along well together. There's never been any major problems. And I think part of it, too, is the uh, Caucasian element here is mostly French descendants and have that laid back, uh, joie de vivre, the happy-go-lucky atmosphere where you just get along with everybody. Never never heard of any, never really cons thought of there any being any major problems here either, racially. We have had a peaceful type of community here. Uh, basically speaking, the Negroes had their own little area of communities, which we call along the, the old river to the uh, east of Marksville. And the whites uh, more or less lived within the corporate limits of the city. Therefore, there was a separation, but not a separation when it came to being peaceful together. Uh, they, they knew their place, of course. 
you know, the standard things. They couldn't go everywhere the whites could go, and they couldn't do everything the whites could do. But they accepted that, and there was never, never a confrontation of any sort. The worst thing that a white person can be called, even if he stands for justice of a black person, is to be labeled a nigger lover. And that's what they're, because he's ostracized by the people of his race. Red River Investigations. Is this Jimmy Reynolds? Yes, ma'am, it is. My name is Hilda Nelson. I'm the mother of Sharon and Karen Sanders. Okay, what is it that you're doing? They won't do anything unless I tell them it's okay. This is a chance for, for, for the girls to say everything that, that they wanted to say. He is the type that he won't be out two weeks before he's going to be hurting someone. And if you really want to know the Vincent Simmons, call the district attorney's office in Marksville and talk to, to Eddie Knoll. Eddie Knoll was the same district attorney who had prosecuted Vincent's case and was still in power 22 years later. We had been trying to contact him, and finally both he and the sheriff's department agreed to participate. In my estimation, I do not believe that Vincent Simmons will ever be rehabilitated. And in addition to that, uh, to be quite frank with you, uh, I believe that, uh, that the crimes that he has committed merits the sentence that he received, and I believe that he should, should serve that entire sentence. 100 years? Yes, sir. I don't think he ought to ever walk out of those, uh, those gates. What kind of guy was he? How do you describe young Vincent? Uh, Vincent was troublemaker, always in trouble. And we'd arrest him quite a few times before that. Vincent's been in trouble with the law for many years, ever since he's about 15, I imagine. Vincent was a little, uh, a little mischievous. The best thing I remember about him, he couldn't keep handcuffs on him. You put handcuffs on him, you turn your back, three seconds after he'd hand them to you. He was a Houdini. <laughs> How he'd do that, I don't know. <laughs> How would you describe what this incident how it's affected the girls and their mother and the family. Oh, I, I, I think it's been I think it's been devastating. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and you, you you almost have to have to talk to them because they feel like you know they're the one who has been imprisoned for all of these many years. We had been speaking on the phone, but we had never met in person. Now, with the district attorney's approval, Karen and Sharon Sanders agreed to be interviewed. Why did you choose? to not be videotaped. Because I don't want him to see my face. I don't want him to know who I am. I don't want him to know what I look like. Why did he even decide to even do this to you? We felt it was so important to do this, to let people know that this isn't about color. It's about a crime, a vicious crime. It's about rape. It's not about color. It's about a crime, a crime that he did. I got a letter from your cousin Keith, but he refuses to be interviewed. Why do you think he won't talk to us? It, it was a traumatic experience for him, just it like it was for us. He was put in a trunk. He had to listen to all the cries, the yells, everything going on, and was paralyzed. There was nothing he could do. And not being able to do anything and hearing someone you love being hurt it's just taking its toll on him. It's, it's just hard on him. And he feels like he has said everything that he needs to say, he said 20 years ago in court. Why did you wait two weeks to report the crime? He put enough fear in us that night that we feared for our life. We thought for sure that he would come back and that he would kill us if we ever did say anything, and we believed it. He managed it for was. a couple of weeks. Was it just sort of finally? Just I was at my cousin's house and uh, where she lived, the dogs started barking and I just knew he was coming. I just knew he was outside. I, I just knew it and, and I was so scared. I just had to tell her. And I told her and I said, you please. I said, you can't tell anyone. But she did. My sister called me and told me that I needed to go to Marksville as soon as possible. And uh, 
I made her tell me why, because I, I didn't want to go. And when she told me, it was like, you, you're listening to it, but you're not believing it. You're in a state of denial. You're in a state of shock. And you're trying to picture this going on. And how? How could this happen? How could it happen to my children? This is not supposed to happen to my children. As soon as the girls reported it, that we went to work on it. I, I assigned, uh, I assigned the men to the case, to working on, to work on the case. My sheriff called me into the office. He was interviewing two young ladies at the time. And he briefed me shortly what was going on, and I asked a few questions to the two young ladies. And I asked if they could give me a description of the subject. And they gave me a fairly good description because I've already knew the man personally. So I told the sheriff that I felt it was uh, Vincent Simmons. I'd go check on it. From what I remember that particular time was that uh, when I arrived, uh, I was assigned to work with Floyd. And uh, shortly afterwards, uh, we had apprehended Simmons. I had just left my sister's house, and I was walking down the street. And here come this car pull off. And I stopped, and they jumped out the car. And they said I was on their wrists. Floyd and I stopped, we got out of the car, and advised him that he was under arrest. Throw my hands up, and he shut me down, put the cuffs on me, put me in the back seat of the car. He got in the car uh, very quietly, as best as I can remember. And I'm constantly asking what I did. They said, you'll find out what you did when you get to, to the jail. We brought him in. And then we set up the lineup, and uh, he was identified. They took me from there to another room, and it told me to sit down. So I sit down in front of him. Had one officer sitting behind the desk, the other was standing by me. Robin and I were both sitting behind the desk. Vincent. Still had the ink on his hands. He wasn't handcuffed. He said, we want this statement. I said, I'm not making no statement. I don't have any did nothing. And all of a sudden, he jumped me and put my head between my legs. He grabbed me, you know, and I was trying to hold on to him so, you know, stop him from beating me. I heard the scuffle. I felt when he pulled my gun out, the sidearm, 9 millimeter, semi-automatic. I caught the, the sight that Simmons had done retrieved uh, Vilmaret's uh, 9 millimeter. I wouldn't carry a, a shell in the chamber, so I knew he couldn't shoot me with it. And that's when this other officer hit me, and when he hit me, that <laughs> fell off on the, on the floor. When I raised my head, he had the gun right in my face, pulling the trigger, where I thought he'd bend the trigger he was pulling so hard. As I was coming up off of my chair, I was retrieving my gun. First thing I did was shove him against the hall door. I had my elbow up his throat. And that's when the other officer hollered to him and told him to move. Simmons was running backwards with the gun, pointing it at, uh, at me. That's when I, my, my chest went to burning. That's when I heard the shot. I thought of it over my mind many times, and he was saying, you're not going to take me alive. And I fired. I fired a single shot. I heard all kind of footsteps. That's all I could hear, footsteps coming in. Call the DA, call the doctor. We had to shoot him just like that. And I said, God, I said, don't let me go out like this. Don't let me die like this. They called all of the different uh, um, uh, uh, agencies in. They called the coroner in for medical treatment. They, 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 they immediately sent him uh, to uh, Huey P. Long Hospital for medical treatment. Uh, you know, we did everything in the world under those circumstances. He is the one who prompted that situation. He's the one who disarmed a law enforcement officer and was trying to shoot those law enforcement officers 
at which time this officer wound up shooting him. When I first got to Angola, handcuffed, walking through these gates and they're slamming doors. They took everything I had. Then they put me upstairs. Told me I was being assigned to a maximum security cell. And night after night, I would wake up screaming and the dudes on the tail would tell me, they said, man, you had some bad, bad nightmare. So one dude, he came to me and he gave me like a prayer told me to say this prayer over and over and over. And this is why I started praying. I started praying and then things became clearer. And it was something about the cell that made me feel more relaxed. I could have time to do the things that I needed to do to try and prove my innocence. Was Vincent Simmons well known to law enforcement? Yes. How law enforcement could have possibly come up with the suspect based on the original statement that the girls gave to them, I don't know. But the very next day, they arrested Vincent Simmons. And 58 days later, he was convicted. Well, I was in the hospital when I, I last saw him. I just had my baby. And he came to visit me. And that's the last time I saw him, until I saw him in court. I didn't go to the trial. I owed a fine at the time. And that, the trial went on a whole week, but I didn't go because it was going to arrest me. I went, but I didn't go in. I couldn't stand to see him sitting with his back turned to me, and I know he didn't want his back to be turned to his mama. So I would go one or two days, and I stayed home after that. I remember being on the jury. The 12 jury was... It was 11 white and one black, and then one alternate jury, and she was a lady. I remember, I remember they saying about he had raped two little white girls. They were some little small old girls. They were around 13 or 14 years old. I, rem I think that's what they were. I remember Eddie No, I think it was Eddie No. he got up and he told us about how he viciously raped these two little girls. And all of the Think about it in my mind, he a dirty dog. And all that was in my mind, he was dirty. You don't do that to children. I'm sitting there on the bench, and the lawyer said, well, just be good. We, we gonna prove you innocent. That's what he's telling me. You know, you got a fair chance in this court, how we gonna prove you innocent. And I'm not believing this. I'm a black man charged with raping two white girls. And the majority of the jury is white. I said, well, I don't have a chance. So I just sat there and just let them do whatever they, they were going to do. I just sat there. It wasn't nothing I could do. I remember they, the little girl saying that he took them to a deserted lane, road, to what we call them lanes, Little California Road. I never been down Little California, but I do know where it's about. I never went down there. I ain't never wanted to go down there. And these little girls said how he raped them. These little girls said that on the witness stand. I can't remember who was first, but I, I remember I can picture Sharon coming out, and she spotted me in, in the courtroom, and she just yelled out, Mama, Mama, help me. Help me, Mama. And I couldn't. I just sat there, and I could not 
do anything to help my child. Tell me about that night. What happened that night? Keith came to our grandparents' house, and uh, he asked us if we would go to his house and help him pick up, because his wife was in the hospital, and uh, she was coming home, and he wanted the house clean. So we went over there, and we washed dishes, some clothes, mowed the grass, you know, picked up, made the place look really nice. And then we uh, left, and on our way home, we stopped for gas. And that's when everything kind of started happening. It was Keith driving, and then me and Sharon. And we just pulled up to the gas pumps, and there this man was standing. He was like, y'all tried to hit me with a car. And we're like, no, we didn't. And uh, at one point, him and Keith were going to fight. And then Keith and him kept talking, and that got smoothed out. And he asked us for a ride. Keith told him yes. And so he got in the car. And I kept elbowing Keith, and Sharon kept elbowing me. And Keith kept just kind of telling us it was going to be OK. And me and Sharon just kind of kept pushing each other. And, and we knew. We knew it wasn't OK. May night, I was with my brother-in-law, Arthur Laverley, and my brother, Bear. And we had left their house. We was going to a, a club, B.B. Moe's. I was at Moe's place. B.B. Moses, the man who had the club, stated that at, at 9 o'clock, Benson was uh, at his club fighting with somebody else in the club. At the same time, they said he was raped. They raped these girls. You can't be two places at one time. I don't remember at that particular time who dropped him off at my place, but him and another guy came there together. And he went in the place five minutes, and he had started a mess at one of the tables with one of the fellas. He wanted to fight, and it, it, it went on off of bed in 15 minutes. I testified on the oath that the night they say Vincent had committed this act that he couldn't have did it because he was at a club with us. You know, the time schedule was wrong, and everything didn't, didn't map up. We remember because we had an argument, had a fight. That's one thing I won't forget that night. What kind of fight was that? Oh, just a scrabble, you know what I mean? Vincent was the body to body dude. I mean, if you're going to do him something, you do it. But that night, he was not there. Couldn't have been there. I told him, I said, I'd go testify, but I wasn't too particular. I said, but they had other people. I said, it was uh, at least 40, 50 people in the place at the time. I said, you should. Uh, Ask somebody else to testify there. I said, because he was there. He said, well, no. He said, well, your testimony and alibi be enough. When he came up, he came up with what classically, uh, you know, a defendant comes up with. It's an alibi. I just wasn't there. And then he brings up several witnesses to say that he wasn't there. And I think that we just flat blew those, uh, 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 that alibi completely out of the water. We were able to, first of all, discredit them by them coming up there and saying that they did not have very many convictions and so forth, and we were able to refute that. The district attorney started at me like I had this record, that record. Well, at that particular time, I really didn't have no police record at that time. Of course, I, had, I got one later on, but I didn't have none there. You know, the misdemeanor with the Marksville police. They didn't believe nothing I said. They were saying that they were there at a particular time, at particularly at one of the local clubs where he was involved in a fight, and that that was going to be part of his alibi. So what I do is I call the police because I wanted to know whether or not the police was called at that time. Yeah, the police was called and whatever. We bring in evidence to establish that it wasn't on that particular day. It wasn't on that night when he was claiming that he was there, that he was involved in a fight. We were able to bring evidence to show that was a bunch of lies. He wanted a ride to a party. He had asked if we would give him a ride to a party. And Keith agreed. And he was the one given directions where we, he wanted us to go. And he kept telling us, turn here, turn there. And we could tell we were getting away from town. 
we kind of knew we were in trouble, knew we were in big trouble. First encounter, I think we stopped. I guess it was a little street, I mean, a little dirt road. And uh, we just stopped there. And I don't remember the whole conversation. There was something about a knife if uh, we reached for a No, that knife. was that was the second time. The first time we stopped. Uh, oh, Lord, I just went blank, too. It was a lake or a bayou or something, but he made Keith park the car where the nose was into the water. Keith started asking him not to hurt us, and he pulled out a gun and told Keith to get in the trunk of the car. He told us to undress, and I started to run. He had already put Keith in the trunk, but Karen started to run, so he put Karen in the trunk. He told me to take off my clothes, so I did. I know you've never been in the back of a trunk, but really there's not that much padding in between your trunk and your back seat, so you can, the people in the trunk can hear everything going on in the back seat. She was crying and telling him that he was hurting her. It was awful because uh, I couldn't reach my sister. I'd always been the one that always kind of protected her or was always the kind of the mother hen, and all of a sudden, there was nothing I could do. I was scared to death. I knew what was happening. I knew what was about to happen, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Everything was out of control. And he was getting frustrated because he was having trouble penetrating Sharon, and uh, he was getting rough with her. And she was crying and carrying on, and I was raising Cain in the back, and through frustration, I, I guess he stopped, and thank God, he did. After that, he put me in the trunk, and then we were all three in the trunk. Felt like hours. I don't know how long he drove, but down dirt roads, and we were really having a hard time breathing then because there was three of us, and there was a tire in the trunk, there was a gas can in the trunk, and we were laying on top of all this stuff, and he was driving on this dirt road and the dust was coming in and we were trying to take small breaths so we wouldn't use up all of our oxygen. And uh, we were trying to find each other's hands and we were praying. And that's what we kept telling each other, to take small breaths and just to pray to God that he'd leave us alone. When he stopped, he uh, took me out of the trunk. And of course, he raped me and then he raped me again in the rectum. And then that was too painful. So he raped me vaginally again. And then he raped me orally. The only comfort I had was in the cross that he had on that night because each time he raped me, I held that cross and even when he was raping me orally, I had my hand up holding that cross. And I held onto that cross because that was my comfort. He was telling me that he came from kind of a large family and that he had either a brother or a sister that was living with a white woman, I believe, and that we could do the same. And uh, really just tried to make small talk, just tried to maybe get him to trust us to see that we weren't going to say anything. I guess I was trying to be his friend so that he would leave us alone, that he'd let us live. I thought maybe if he liked us, you know, that he would, uh, he'd let us live. Sharon and Keith stayed in the trunk the whole time until we got to the graveyard. And then he got out and he opened the trunk. It was a relief. And, um, uh, then he, he cut the tires of our car. No, the tire had already been cut. Oh, uh, the tire had already been cut. And well, he just, uh, he asked if we had thought about it, if we were gonna say anything, had we thought about it? And that if we opened our mouth, we could be like the rest of the people that were out there. We could be dead. And we assured him that we would never say anything, that we would not open our mouth. He had our word. 
And so he gave Keith the keys back, and we drove him to a street where we believed he lived because he had us drop him off there. Keith did ask us if we were OK. Mm -hmm. and we all kind of checked with each other to make sure we were all three OK. And that was about the extent of our conversation. It was like nightmare just, had ended. We just couldn't believe it. I mean, we were in just, it, it was just unbelievable. And we just, we didn't really say much of anything to each other. I don't even know that we even said anything to each other, other than we knew that we wouldn't be saying anything to anyone, that we would keep it quiet. And then when we got home, me and Sharon got in the tub, and we scrubbed until we couldn't scrub anymore. Are there any questions in your mind that those two little girls were raped? Absolutely not. They were raped. They were raped by the defendant, Vincent Simmons. You come back with verdicts of guilty. Guilty as charged of count one, attempted aggravated rape of Sharon Sanders, and count two, attempted aggravated rape of Karen Sanders. Once you've done that, you will have done your duty. I thank you. The jury went in and they was talking about it. It had a few guys, white guys in there, and they was like ready to, let's get this over with, you know, look what y'all think. And everybody said guilty, and the first time I didn't say nothing. When my mama told us that they had found him guilty and he was going for 50 years on this one, and 50 on that one, 100 years. And we all was in here crying, you know. I laughed. I laughed in the courthouse because a hundred years. I see for something I didn't do. And the only thing I could say, however long it take me, I'm gonna give it back. And that was all I said. That face is engraved in our mind forever. When you look into someone's eyes that is doing the things to us that he did to us, you don't forget it. Those eyes do not change. Mm -mm. He may get grayer or he may this and that, but those eyes are the same. Those eyes that I looked into, that I begged. So you just knew to sit here with me and swear to God. I'm innocent. And I know one thing, if I lie, I know what I'm facing. I'm innocent of this charge that I'm in prison on. The whole story hasn't all been revealed. The lawyer didn't ask certain questions that he should have asked, which would have revealed all. These things were not done. So when we're in a system and you poor and you don't have the money to hire a lawyer that'll bring out all these facts, you see, the lawyer can be, if he's white, can be a part of the system. No, no, no. I'm mad. I'm defending you. I, I was uh, hired by the injured defender board to defend you. But in my heart, nigga, you shouldn't have done that. Well, they definitely got a speedy trial. No doubt about it. Did he have an effective defense? Some people would probably say no. We all have imperfections, and our system has some imperfections. And our law does not demand that a person be given a perfect trial. The thing that uh, our Constitution and our laws in this country demands of us is that every person who comes before that court is given a fair trial. And, uh, and, and indeed, uh, I think after you have reviewed uh, this record, uh, you know, you have to concur that he was given a fair trial. We did review the record. 
and kept coming back to the documents that Vincent brought to the parole board hearing. They included the original statements that Karen and Sharon gave to the police, the medical report, and the lineup photo. None of this evidence was presented at his trial. Even back in 1977, defense lawyers and a defendant were entitled to any information that would be favorable to them, that would be exculpatory. I don't know the trial attorneys in this case. Without even knowing them, if they had any information, this is almost like ammunition in a case that was practically hopeless. Any information, I would think that they would have used it. In my 26 years, one of the things that I have had uh, and, and anybody who is, uh, uh, has practiced here uh, uh, in this parish can confirm that, uh, particularly on, on serious crimes, especially, okay, I have an open file policy where they can come in and, and get anything that they want. If Eddie Knowles telling the truth and that information was turned over to the defense lawyers, then why didn't they use it? Why didn't they ask questions about it? Are they stupid? Are they ineffective? Did they not know what they were looking at? Or did they not have it? Because this information is explosive. It's valuable information that any defense lawyer, even if they hate their client, would use it. Because it wouldn't be a fair trial unless they used it. The very first statement that they gave, they were both asked if they knew the name of the perpetrator. And they both said no. The very next day, when they gave a handwritten voluntary statement, they still didn't know a name. But at trial, they testified when asked if they heard the name of the perpetrator during the conversation, they said yes and said the name Simmons. In 1977, unless a defense attorney made a specific request and said, I know these girls gave statements, and I know they said things in them that are different than what they're saying today, so I want to use them to impeach them. Or they said things in them that show that Vincent Simmons didn't commit this crime. Unless the defense attorney could go in and say specifically that, he generally wasn't going to get the statement. And if he didn't know the statement existed how, or what was in it, how can he go in and say that? I don't think any of those statements were turned over to the defense lawyers. If there was open file discovery, did they read those, take notes, and sufficiently have enough information and knowledge of what was contained in those statements so that when they got to trial, they could question the three victims? You think, Len, so when he said, at first when we were over there, Keith was calling him something, but me and Sharon can't remember. When we first went in, Jonathan, not everything came to us right away. We were scared, and I didn't really want to talk because we had said we weren't going to. And this was our first time to tell our families. This was our first time, you know, I mean, everything was coming out. But with all the emotion. And all the questions and everything, and, and our family being there, and everybody was so emotional, and we were so emotional, you know? So, I mean, but there was no, there was never any doubt as to who had raped us, ever. In the victim statement, Police repeatedly asked them, did they know who the guy was? They said no. Would you be able to identify this guy if you ever saw him again? One of them said no, because she says all blacks look alike. He was the line that Sharon said he was sort of short and he was husky. He was husky and all blacks look alike to me, so I would know him if I ever saw him. I don't, I have no idea. I, I don't even know why I said that, because I would have known him. I knew him, I mean, when they had him lined up, I knew him right off. I, I knew without a shadow of a doubt. I don't know why. I don't know if it was because I was nervous or just not everything was coming to me. I don't know. So just like, because at that parole board hearing, you know, people, I think, were shocked because at that moment. It's not a personal thing at all. I mean, I don't, I'm not prejudiced. I don't have anything against black people at all. And I didn't mean to offend anybody when I said what I did, but... It is a fear. It's just a caution. You know, I'm cautious, but it's not hatred and it's not a dislike for black people. What about the doctor's report? What can you tell me about them? They went for a physical examination on May 24th. And I'm looking at the report from Dr. Bordelon. He says with Sharon 
that her hymen was intact and she does not know if he put his penis in her vagina all the way. At trial, she testifies that he absolutely penetrated her and that he climaxed. It would have been interesting for the defense lawyer to have that information, not only to question her, but I think the most important thing about that police report, besides the fact that it says that her hymen is intact, that there's no bruising, that there's no physical signs of tearing or anything. Why didn't they present the doctor at trial? If the defense lawyers had have known that Dr. Bordelon had conducted this physical examination, don't you think they would have called him to trial since the prosecutors didn't? Exculpatory material is information that the prosecution is obligated to turn over even if they get it in the middle of trial. Even if at night that night they look through their file and find, oops, this police report, this statement, this doctor's report, that has information in it that would be Brady material. They have the obligation to run, not walk, and deliver it to the defense and make sure that they have it. I don't know what they will think about it, but I was led to believe that two little girls was raped, not one. That's what I remember. So not my mistake, I mean, you got 50 years for both rape. They each rape. But what if it, one of them was still a virgin, how could he get 50 years of peace for each rape? The doctor would have never found no harm hell still intact if she was raped for 30 minutes by me. He was trying to penetrate her, and uh, through frustration, he stopped. And thank God, she was still a virgin. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I was not a virgin. You know, when he, all this, after this t took place, and there are several different entries, and so, no, I mean, you know, Sharon was a virgin, and I was not left mm -hmm. a virgin. That's right. Under Louisiana law, the slightest of penetration consti constitutes the crime itself. So, you know, as long as that penis touched that vagina, that alone would have been sufficient, but it was much more than that. I mean, he tried for quite some time, even to the point of actually climaxing, and was unable to actually penetrate her. The photo lineup. Because obviously that shocked people. It's a shocking photographic lineup. The prosecutor did not introduce any evidence that prior to trial, that there was an out-of-court identification in the form of a physical lineup. Why would they not have used that? Because maybe their procedure was not fair because they have a photograph showing that he's handcuffed. We don't know that because there's no transcript as to that out-of-court identification and whether that procedure was held correctly. There's not, even a, there's not even a hearing on that. The defense lawyer allowed this case to go to trial for a victim to walk in and say, I did him. And we don't know if he was handcuffed or not because the issue never came up. Isn't that a question you'd want to know as a defense lawyer? Or maybe you'd even want to know now. When he was in the lineup, he had no handcuffs on him. Positively none. But uh, after, after the lineup, and he was, we put him on the arrest, under arrest and read him his rights. And we handcuffed him. Of course, I noticed he had a picture somewhere or another with handcuffs still by the lineup. But then the lineup, was, it was over. He was still in the line. but. Uh, the, he had been identified. In other words, that was over. Then they put the handcuff to take him upstairs. Did you help set up the lineup as best you would recommend? The lineup, yes. What did you do? Like, how did you get the lineup together? Oh, we got some other inmates, the best I can recall, from upstairs. Took a picture of him, of the lineup, with Vincent still handcuffed, and the numbers. And when it came for the girls to ID him, we took off the handcuffs. That's I can recall. When we saw him, no one had handcuffs on. And it's funny that three of us managed to pick the same guy out. And the only way you could, we could have done that is to know who raped us that night. Maybe two of you, maybe by chance, maybe we picked the same guy, but three? It's because we knew who we'd spent time with. There was no doubt in Keith's mind, my mind, and Sharon's mind, and there's still no doubt in Keith's mind, Sharon's mind, or my mind. It just becomes an issue of easy to explain 20 years down the line once you're looking at all of it. 
Why didn't they explain it then? Why wasn't there either pretrial hearings or answers at trial given to the jury of there weren't problems in this case? We were fair. Everything that I have has been open. It's been a, a, above board. Any of these lawyers who want to come and look at my files, I open them up to them because, you know, if, 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 there, if there's truly some kind of a defense, uh, God knows I don't want to convict anybody who is not guilty, okay? You know, I don't want that on my conscience. After numerous requests for an interview, Vincent's trial attorney, Harold Bruyette, finally sent a letter. In it, he wrote that he had never seen the doctor's report. He also told me in a phone conversation that at the time of the trial, he had not reviewed the DA's files, including the original statements or the lineup photo. Prosecutor says, we've proved this case. In fact, let's talk about his closing, where he tells the jury to visualize themselves being placed in a trunk, latch being closed in a small area. Can you imagine the type of torment you would fear? That's the golden rule in law. Should have been objected to. You never put a jury in the place of the victim. It's improper, it's prejudicial, it's unethical, it's illegal, and he did it. Can you imagine? Good people of a parish, you've had to listen to this crime. How could you not convict? You'd convict a refrigerator sitting there. You can call it technicalities. The general public might call it a technicality because the government or a prosecutor would say, technicality, I was fair. Can't help it that they're a sore loser and won't do his time happily for 100 years. It's not a technicality. It's, it's bigger than that. It was evidence that didn't come to light. It was evidence in a prosecution file that was withheld. It's a technicality that's called illegal, unethical, immoral. How does a prosecutor sleep at night? I've got to live with my own conscience. You know, I don't want to try anybody and convict anybody who is not guilty of a crime. And to be quite frank with you, you know, uh, I, I agree with the, with the thought that I would prefer having uh, 10 persons uh, who are guilty to get away with it than to, than to convict one innocent person. How do we know that the jury would have not convicted him anyway if they had all the information? That's the point here. If the jury had a convicted Vincent, with everything that, they, that he was entitled to have under the law, then the jury has spoken and it's been a fair trial. And prosecutors love to rest on that, that I gave him a fair trial, therefore I'm exonerated. And when it's not the case, then the whole system doesn't work. If we bend the rules here and we say, well, you know, it's okay if this guy doesn't get a fair trial because after all, he's really guilty. And it's okay if this guy doesn't get a fair trial because if he didn't commit this crime, well, he probably committed another one we haven't caught him for. And where do you stop? The rules have to be the same for everybody. They have to be the same all the time. We all have to be able to count on the integrity of the legal system. Else nobody's going to have any respect for it. And pretty soon there won't be any rules. And that's where the problem is. You know, we have to do it right for Vincent Simmons because we want it done right for ourselves. Given the facts of this case, and given the scenario, the judge elected to impose a 50-year sentence on each count to run consecutive, or a total of 100 years. And I want to tell you, I fully concur with that sentence. I do not think that that man should ever hit the streets again. Because if he does, I think that other people are going to be put in jeopardy. You know, really and truly, Jonathan, how many times that we have thought about how things could have changed and things could have went a different direction that night and how that could, we could be out here. I mean, you know, how many nights and how many times we thank God so that well. it went the way that it did go because had it gone the way that we thought it was going to go, that we believed it was going to go, we would have a tombstone out here somewhere. And we live in fear every day. I can't imagine the life we would live knowing that he was free. And especially, you know, at this point where there is no remorse, you know, and no rehabilitation. And it would just... Uh, it would endanger somebody. I really feel like it would be a danger to someone else's life. I could understand if he'd have got 25 years. 
But a hundred years, uh-uh. When someone has chosen to commit a rape, they have changed the victim's life forever. Um, it doesn't mean that the victim always has to have a, a horrible life and can never enjoy life again, but they will never view the world, they'll never view sex, um, they'll never view their own sense of safety again the same way. They, they have been given a life sentence, and I don't think that 100 years is too long, but I do think it's interesting to sort of compare cases and see, you know, who, who gets the life sentences and the 100-year sentences and who gets the five-year sentences. Society has put Vincent in and given him the maximum sentence, which would not have been given had he been white. Would not have been given. It was no way that he, if he had been white and done that to two little black girls, no way, Jose. After it happened, we all accepted for what it was. You understand? We knew that he hadn't did it, but what could we do? Couldn't fight the system. It was all white. Who cares? Just a black man off the street. That's the only thing I can see. He deserved another chance. He need a new, he need a new hearing. It's too much uh, that come back to haunt you. that a great injustice has been done to me. I feel that the only reason that they're doing this to me is out of hate, out of hate for me as a black man. Because they said it was a black man that did it. They chose a black man to get a charge to, and it's me. But I have faith. I have faith, that's what I've been living with fate that somewhere somebody will come to help me improve my innocence. And I believe in God. And I believe if I'm right and they wrong, I believe God is going to open the door. That's what I believe. I'd go to church and I'd see all everybody's little boy the same age with Vincent and he wasn't there. That was tough on me, too. But I pray and pray that it's God's will. That's how I look at it. It must be God's will. As a Christian, we're taught that we have to forgive, that we need to forgive spiritually. I. I struggle with this because it has affected my daughter's lives in so many different ways that it's, it's hard for me to, I try, and I'm still struggling daily on forgiving him. But I will never forget the things that he's done. Two years have passed since meeting Vincent Simmons. Since then, we have spoken with almost every person associated with the crime. Much has been revealed, but there were no surprise witnesses, no new physical evidence, no fingerprints, no DNA, no dramatic confessions. We are no closer to the truth now than when we began. The only ones that will ever really know the truth are me and Sharon and Keith and Vincent and God, those are the only ones that are ever going to really know the truth. But I would like to look him in the eyes. I would like to face him face to face someday. I'd like to see if at some point he would break and admit to what he's done. I, I would just like to see if that we sat face to face, that if he could look me in the eyes and I can look him in the eyes, whether he could still hang on to the lie that he's telling. I spoke to the women, and they said they'd like to meet with you. And I wanted to know how you felt about that. Sure, I would meet with them. I would like to meet with them myself. Well, well I, would, I would tell them to their face that it's not me, you know, that I'm not the man that raped them, you know. And 
like that, you know, I can only say that I'm sorry for what everybody got to go through, what everybody has been through, you know, and ask for forgiveness. That's all I can, you know, because uh, I'm not guilty of the charge. You know, would you like the chance to talk to him? Yes, I would like the chance to talk to him. He's not really looking into the camera like he's kind of thinking about what he's going to say. As he says it. As he says it, and he asks for forgiveness for a crime when he realizes what he's, he has said, he, for a crime that he didn't commit. He wants to ask for forgiveness. I just wonder what it is that he wants forgiveness for. Yeah, to me, it's, 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 a, it's a big conspiracy from what I understand, from the evidence and stuff like that, it's a conspiracy. And it's nothing can change that idea in my mind of what I've found in the evidence. I realized that whatever I did would have to be for me, you know, that I couldn't expect anything from him. So whatever I went for would have to be for me and not to try and get any kind of confession or get him to show any kind of emotion or anything that if I went, it, I couldn't go except for myself. We've had enough. You know, we've had enough of struggling with the pain and the fear and all that. We finally have come to the place now to say enough's enough. We're leaving this behind. Well, I, I thank God for having the chance to be able to meet with him. There's no need to, to hide any longer. The truth is being brought out now. Say the word, they want to say for her, and then you just kind of go to that flow, all right? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna try, okay? Because this is very hard for us, as you probably know. Okay, but the thing is, is that we came today not to free you from your prison, but to free us from our prison. I cannot change what you did to us, but I can change how I let it affect my life. No one knows our fears and our daily struggles. You have no idea how you hurt us. You'll never know. Only through God am I able to forgive you, but I cannot and will not ever forget the pain you have caused us. And no matter how I feel about you, God still loves you. The truly sad thing is, you're not willing to admit your guilt, which puts you in a bigger prison than Angola. I may not walk out of here pain-free or fear-free, but I can try to take back control of my life. And that's what I've wanted to say. And for me, there's a lot of things I've wanted to say to you, a lot of letters I've written that's never gotten mailed about the anger and the pain that I felt and that I feel. But I don't think it's important. I think the main thing that's important is to tell you that I don't hate you and that today I am closing the door to my pain. Today, this is it. I'm letting go. And I have to tell you that on my own, I can't forgive you, but through God, I definitely can. And that's it. That yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can. Well, first, I would like to open with a few words from the scripture. Scripture. From the scripture. Commit.
Commit your ways to the Lord, and he shall bring it to pass. Psalm 37 to the 5. Do not plan without God. God seems to have a delightful way of upsetting the plans we have made. When we have not taken him into account, we get ourselves into circumstances that were not chosen by God. And suddenly we realize that we have been making our plans without him. I, I appreciate what you're saying, but you're reading from the scripture, and if you have a statement you want to say or anything, say that. And, what is I, am I being allowed to yeah, I'm allow you. say what I'm going to say? To you. What is the point of reading this the scripture? Yeah, well, I have some questions. I thought I would have been able to ask some questions. I thought this is what the interview was about. No, the interview was about us telling you that we don't hate you and we're letting go of the pain and the fear and the miserable life that we were left with. It's what the interview was for because we don't hate you. It's not about asking questions. You ask me a question. Now, my question is going to be directly based on your statement that you No, made. we're not going there because I, I, I tell you what, we've already been through this. We're not going through it anymore. I mean, we're not putting ourselves through it anymore. You have a question about the legal system, you need to take it up with a lawyer or someone else. Me and Sharon are here because we have to and be. The thing you need to realize is that you know the truth. You do. I mean, the legal system looks wonderful and great or whatever. That's great. I'm glad you have that to occupy your time. But you know the truth. And until you let go of your truth, you're going to stay in your mental prison forever. And that's sad. Yeah, well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I love that. I thank God for that. I don't hold anything against you or your family. I have no hate in my heart. Why would you? Why would you have any hate towards us? Because from what I have here, the evidence. Have you ever dealt with the things. rape issue and not the legal no, issue so I'm much? Talking well, I'm talking about y'all's statement. What, what are you doing statement? here then, since you're innocent? What are you doing here? Y'all putting me here. We did? Yes. No, a choice that you chose I mean, to make put you here. here. No, OK, well, I think, we're, we're, I think we've had enough. Yeah. We're here to do okay. reconciliation and not try the case. Judy, what do you think? I think. I think it's kind of going sour. Hence, so maybe one day you can get out of your pain of your misery. I feel sorry for him. He's not going to be able to experience the freedom that we're experiencing. And he just don't realize by talking about what he's done, what a release that would be for him. He would find spiritual freedom for himself. And I've left, I just feel bad for him. Well, I felt bad about the way that the interview went. I thought it was designed for us to talk. Why are they continually lying about these things? You know, but yet they say they forgive me for what I've done them. You know, I've been hurt too. We have a constitutional right to a fair trial. I was denied that. I guess we'll kind of continue living our lives, but live them a little freer, a little easier. But there'll always be a little sadness in our heart and a little burden for him. You know, I, I don't know where that'll lead us. You know, Sharon's talked about the prison ministry. Maybe 
the sadness will take her to that ministry. I don't know. And if there's some other person out there that's struggling, I just want to say, you know, you have to talk about it. Because until you let it out, you can't begin to heal. If I die here, you know, I like my body to be turned into ashes and just spread it in the universe. That's what I want to happen. If I die here, so will you make that happen? If I die here, that's what I want you to do. Thank you.